thank you. It's a, it's a privilege to be here um, in one of the two top schools of Spain, maybe the world. You don't know how lucky you are because, um, you know, Spain has the best contemporary architecture in the world and it must be because of the schools and you one of the two best schools. So um, uh, I don't think you realize that. You need someone from outside to tell you that. Um, I've been running a master's course um, for those who are not part of the class um, on my research in Africa into how Africans make space. They make space differently to us. They're human beings. They wash, they cook, and they have belief systems, but they have certain different perceptions. And what's happened is this, this giant of a continent, Africa, um, this, this giant continent here, is, is big enough to put the whole of China, the whole of North America, the whole of Eastern Europe and Europe and India, and you still have more space left over. And it's sort of woken up after a lot of exploitation as part of colonialism to its own potential. And what's happening here in 50 years is happening there in five years. So don't let anybody tell you there's no work for architects. Um, in fact, we have, a, we have this unbelievable challenge. We're trying to introduce best practice because things are happening so fast that you can't change. And what I'm doing is I've had to find a different way of practicing. And what I've been saying to my students in the class, especially those from Latin America and Korea and, and Jordan, you need to go back to your countries and as a younger generation of architects, you can make your own work. Architecture's really got to do with who you know. You still need to be connected, but you can also go out and engage with the other 96% of the world who hasn't previously had access to architects, but you need to design the way you get paid, okay? You need to be active about it, and it's not impossible. And I've had to learn. I've always been uh, someone I taught at the School of Architecture for 30 years. Professor Pancho Gedish, who's the only living member of Team 10, who was my mentor, he's now 90. He wouldn't let you teach design unless you, you designed. So you, everything you designed, you had to show to the school. Okay? And, um, and he, en he encouraged us to embrace our context. In other words, whatever context you're in, whether you're Spanish or wherever you're from, Embrace the politics and the reality of your context, and within that you can learn to grow. And I used to, myself and one student, I did work for 30 years while I was teaching, and then I left teaching in 2007. I used to teach second year, and I've had to find other ways of operating, and I've formed working relationships with three colleagues, one who's in England and one who's there. And it got very confusing for clients because you said my one partner's in England at Cambridge, my other one's in Rwanda. So we formed an entity and we now have a website. And because we formed an entity, you can, you can actually start working. And we've started to do sustainable ish initiatives in Rwanda. Um, in the Rwandan context, we're changing Rwandan policy. We're helping design it. We're meeting incredible challenges, and we're doing case study projects. And what I do for case study projects, I'm going to show you a project we've just done with Alto University in Finland, who have a public building program. They appointed me as director. We went there for two weeks, and we've now just got a book that's come out, which we, which we present as a piece of research to the government, okay? Because they don't have ability. And I'm saying a lot of schools of architecture should engage with with dealing with real problems. So that's me trying to look serious. This is my partner, Timothy. He worked for one of the top firms in London, never wants to work in London again. And Michael Ramage is an engineer who trained in an architectural school at MIT. And the three of us um, formed Light Earth. We're founding partners. I do some work on my, as part of Peter Rich. I do some work as part of that. We reach a mature agreement. Um, we met over this project, which I'm not going to go into in detail. We took a big risk, and it was very successful. Um, we ended up being the contractors, even though we didn't want to be, and we realized when we, if you do this work, you have to be like a Ladio de Esther. You have to have a construction company. 
You can't do some training and run away. Okay? And, uh, and then we did a project for Prince Charles. He, we won an award in London, and Prince Charles phoned us up and said, on the lawn of his house, Buckingham Palace is here, would we, from his garden, in three weeks, build a structure? So from the soil of his garden, we built a structure, and then the British public could go through it, and they could see what you can do with the soil from your garden, if you think about it. But of course, we can't do the, this without learning from the Moors and without learning from the Catalans. Okay? Um, and then a billionaire, who is an advisor and a philanthropist, got us to do an office in Chicago. He's a wonderful man, but he hates the corporate world. He hates the, the way the ceilings are. He hates the, the furniture. He wanted a unique interior that's like home. And so in the context of, of that world, we, we designed, we, we got hold of timber that Americans normally throw away because they're beetles that eat it. And we went to a burnt forest and we, 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 we cut it and then we did this flight of, we took the ceilings out and uh, he w said he wanted an architecture that you can taste, you can smell and you can touch. And Americans are not good at that. One of the reasons they're not good at it is their, their labor rate is $150 an hour, which means you don't do that. You only do machined materials. So you live in a Gucci world. You never have the feeling of natural materials. And these are some of the heroes, and we wanted to tell his stories. He said an office must be like home. It must be like a color. It must be like a street. Um, and this is the wood. And then we've started to do a number of projects which I will share with you uh, in Rwanda, all of them exploring different technologies, soil technology, soil technology, timber technology, because we, we, we're in a context where the, all the materials are important. There's no, no, um, no uh, indigenous materials. And there's some other architects who are doing good work. This is a woman center that gathers the rain, and then it feeds it into composting, and it's part of a farm done by someone, uh, an American. This is an Italian that's come into town. And what we're doing is we have to have policies. So we've, we've helped the government develop a green economy approach to transforming it because everything's brought across two corrupt countries and costs seven times the price. So we've, we've used the British politicians as a way of doing this. Funding for environment and climate change. You can see we've had to deal with these agencies. And you as an architect have the power to, to, to make policy. And then we're planning for urban growth in a, in, in a city that's on a hill and where there's a need for high density cities. And what the class I'm running with my students is I've, I've shown them how Africans traditionally used to have a very strong sense of place when they were on the land. But now that they're forced into getting into cities, they lose all the strength of what they learned there. Their social structure collapses, and they don't know how to adapt. And they're looking to us to show them best practice. And we're looking at your town here. We're looking at good examples. And I'll show you how we're trying to take what Africans' needs are and what's best practice in the developed world and put them together. This is what Americans and South Africans try and sell to Africa. It's finished. You don't do that anymore. You don't have the space. It's actually immoral. And um, this is the, rea the reality of the cities that you walk into. You have all the infrastructure in Spain. You have, like, you have better infrastructure in, in Spain than New York has, than London has. You have, this, you have new bus stations. You have new, everything's new. It's, to us, it's like amazing. You're so lucky. <laughs> And, you know, the realities of clogged city centers, no planning. Um, you go into the city of Kigali and they've, they're doing new buildings, but there's too many cars. You should ban the cars. You have no public car transport. And then you go to, you go to uh, uh, Angola, and this housing has been built by the Chinese. It's been standing for two years with no one in it because there's no one to occupy it. It's too high end. So you get these almost immoral situations that happen. And we seeing the potential to offer help. This is a growing reality. Okay? And we don't really understand it. Okay? 
But if there's a fire in there, the fire goes through the whole space. It's a problem. And, um, you know, this is another world. This is a different mindset. Soon these people will be buying this because they can buy it for nothing and get free labor. And this is the reality of those changes, urban inequality. So, what you need, 81% of the people will completely depend on urban infrastructure for food and to remove their waste to provide a livelihood. So, you need to look at infrastructure. Okay? Infrastructure and services, garbage city Cairo, recycling of garbage. Um, you know, a child has got to be washed with water once a day to remain healthy. How, how do you deal with water? I've just been to Harare in Zimbabwe, and people like yourselves are living in suburbia, and suddenly you have no water and no electricity. You have to make your own. It's a different reality. And then we have informal and low-capacity construction. This is a, a, a hand uh, sun-dried brick that is put in a kiln. Okay, you have good bricks that are made, but there's not enough, um, not enough people using them. Okay, and then the city authorities go to Singapore to ask them to give them something to show the president. And you want to be sick. You can't build this, it's nonsense. There's no one to occupy it, it's not sustainable, but you're dealing with that reality. Then you have these terrible materials brought in from China. Okay. Reliance on imported low quality concrete and in situ blocks and cement finish, bad quality. And we know that the world loves concrete. This is 8% of all man made CO2 is produced by concrete. So these are the realities we deal with. Let me go back here. And um, those are different energies Rwanda energy and sanitation. And then what happens here is everything arrives here. Then it goes over land across two countries, corrupt countries, to get here. And their greenhouse of emission from a truckload. One truckload is equivalent to 100 light bulbs burnt for 1,000 hours. So from an energy point of view, it's completely unsustainable. Hold on, please. Okay, energy intensity of folks, place. Building products uh, and their impact. You've got incredible forests in the Congo, which you don't want to use a renewable resource. You can plant renewable resources. It's terrible, the destruction that's going on. And then you have a look at what's happening with the, the forests of the world, starting with Brazil and Indonesia, moving all the way down. So when we do a project, we try to work with local timbers, but we don't, um, we don't go and, uh, and use anything that's an indigenous wood. We recently got this, this project. Um, it's for cricket because the, uh, the Rwandese were French, but then through the genocide, Mitterrand backed the wrong side. They fell out with the French, and now they're trying to be English. And, um, and the final thing of being English is to play cricket. Um, and we got this project, which is funded by a local charity in England. And, um, there it is. And it's two cricket grounds. And uh, our little small practice, which is three people in Rwanda, got the project. And we realized that we wanted the buildings to reflect the hillside. And we wanted to build out of local, local sand with no transport, 5% cement, no steel. Because the steel has to be imported. And we realized if we made hand pressed tiles with 5% cement, using unskilled labor, unemployed labor, we could start building. Then we also realized that this is a big catchment area for rain, and you have big downpours of rain, you know, 200 millimeters in an hour type of thing. So we needed to design a system whereby we could collect the rain. So you engage intelligent engineers so you can come up with a system, because it's important that you deal with the water, because it can be very destructive if you don't. And then this is another project. It's in the, uh, it's an Italian who's married to a local and he's got a very nice restaurant and he wants to develop the restaurant. And what we've done here is we're experimenting with local eucalyptus, which you can renew, and we can build a five to a 10 story building with three details. 
And I'm interested to see you have a master's student in Damien that's, that's, that's looking at similar renewable energy projects. So we and what we do is my colleague who's at Cambridge University uses the, the, the civil engineering component of Cambridge University to research the strength of these materials. And then we've also found a German who, who grows local hay. He then compresses it locally. He bought a machine for 9 million euros into a 6 centimeter board. And with that, two layers of that, you've got a good floor to walk on. You can't shoot a bullet through it. It's very good acoustically. So we're finding how can you, how can you develop new products. And there's the eucalyptus. There's the landscape. And you have waste products, which I'll talk about later, from coffee, which you can use. And here's Strawtech. It's proved by the Germans proved by the English, and suddenly we can build a thousand houses at 40% saving of money just by using this product because you, you, can, you can cut a window in here and you don't have to have a lintel. We've always looked at labor intensive and suddenly we're not. So this is, this is how we build that building. I'll just go through it quickly. And this is going ahead and we're looking at how we treat the wood because you need to dry the wood and we've got the Finnish advising us because they have a special technique. So what I'm trying to say is we need to learn from one another and set up these different synergies and this is what it looks like from the street. Okay. Now we look at Rwanda, the land of the rolling hills. Um, a city that has virtually no records of who owns land or whatever, it's, it'd be like a nightmare for you to walk into it. And um, I was called by the president to advise him and set up a team of uh, a Rwandan team to design the government offices and the state house because the Chinese pulled a terrible office park out of the bottom drawer and said, we will build this for you for nothing. And he said, I don't want it because it, it's almost an insult to us. So we headed up. And we started to look, what does it mean to be Rwandan? You have this landscape of volcanoes. These are gorillas. They're not Rwandans, but they make a lot of money from tourism. You have water, beautiful water. You have the peasants dealing with the landscape in a beautiful way, every square inch. You have a lake that has methane, which is energy, if you harness the energy. You have beautiful boats where you put a lantern on either end, and you, you, you light the lanterns and you put your net in and you harvest fish. Then you have the traditional way the king used to live, but it's made out of grass. Rwandans don't know what to do. And then I can't show you the state house because it's classified. They want to build it. We're busy negotiating on a fee at the moment. But um, what we did do is we noticed that the kings always used to be on the hill, on the highmost point. This is from the 1800s. It's a sketch of mine. And then this is the model of the state house. This is where the president stays. That's where Obama stays or Yorking. And this is the, the council chambers and this. But the whole thing is designed on sustainable principles. And it's all designed by two ingredients. One reflecting the landscape and, an, and, and another one uh, looking at alternative uh, technologies which ventilate properly. And the place for the, the president, the council chamber is a beautiful space and we use the antiquas that are five meters high which are woven to deal with acoustics. And it reflects the land of a thousand hills. And other projects we did. Then we started looking. I'm not going to go into detail because I've, I spent a, a, a week ago I spent time with my class looking at the lessons you can learn from the peasants, which are incredible. And then I did a project with the, the School of Architecture in Arkansas in America. Martin Blackwell was the head of school. He engaged my services as a, as a director to, to interrogate building neighborhood as part of social and economic prosperity and trying to demonstrate to the Rwandans that you, on a sloping site you can build to a density of 220 units per hectare instead of 35 units per hectare. And we looked at these examples where, you'd, where there's a strong sense of public space. There's a strong sense backyard is, front yard is. Then we went with the students and we, we measured up how ordinary Africans go into the city and what they do in this context, how they adapt themselves. There must be lessons to learn. We looked at language being important. What is the meaning of family or door? The front door means family. So we've done a whole, one, one 
a lecture from Arkansas who's done a whole book on uh, the idea of patio, the idea of front door, the idea of kale in the language of Rwandans. And we took this sloping site and he took um, one hectare, looked at the topography, looked at the fact that because it's very steep you need to move in a transverse way, looked how you integrated public space, um, looked how you, you, had a, you had shared space, looked at how you collect water um, within that because you have downpours, and then looked at um, offering different types of typologies that you could grow into. And maybe this is the only infrastructure that you build, and then the people build their houses. And then we brought people from Mexico City because in Mexico City, peasants build two rooms at a time on a sloping site with a structure. So it's not an end product. It's a different way of looking at housing. I didn't design these houses. We got, I went to the dean, of, he got $20,000, and they have a, an urban planning unit off campus with some professionals who worked with the students to, to develop the project to this stage. It looks as though it might go ahead. And then the three of us were commissioned to do a project here, which is very strategic in relation to the city. And we wanted to do a vibrant new high density mixed use development with a variety of types and size of dwellings. A sustainable community with a wealth of civic functions. Developers come to Rwanda and they say, we'll do housing for you, but they don't do any public functions. We say, if you build a barrio, a barrio is this, and that is housing, and that is health, and, and this is public space, and this is open space. It, it, it's more than housing, but you have to educate these people because they, they're not aware of that. We showed how it could link into the green system. We showed how you had generous external places. You kept this as a public space. You, uh, you contained the cars on the end, and you only allowed a certain number of cars. You had a mix of types. And then what you did is you had a public space system that ran through the whole scheme so children can move and go to school properly. And then we learned from good European practice and my African research, and we brought the two together we knew we had to go three stories, and this is the first time a Rwandans lived in three stories. We knew we had to share a common space. This is not design, this is pre-feasibility stage. But we're looking, do you access this from the street or do you access it from the courtyard? Do you have a front, do you have a back? What is a row house? So you're questioning first principles. And what you're doing is you're showing that if you use the topography in a nice way, you can, you can make very, this gives you a privacy gradient. You can create beautiful spaces where you have a private courtyard. So that's what we're teaching in, in my master class. And we use this product, and we look at how we can build that housing. And then in the middle of this, we do a project in, uh, on spec for someone in Addis Ababa who wants to build this node, uh, which we, we, did a, we did a quick design for them. Um, I don't know if this is going to go to head but it has to do with um, the fact that you, you have restaurants on the ground, you have, you have children's facilities. It's, it's, it's in neighborhoods where they build big communities in Addis Ababa. The children and the parents have nothing to do. They have nowhere to go. So we investigated how you could have a series of restaurants and facilities, supermarkets, convenience stores. Children could have a, a, a three stories of where they do homework, they do learning, they've got cinemas, they've got education, and sports facilities. And then back to housing. What we did on the housing, we looked at, we looked at the Ipigano, which is the courtyard. We looked at the fact of how you could make that a public space. You could have your own back garden, you could have room for a servant, and then you could have the muse type situation, learning from what we knew with English practice. We're busy walking around Pampalona and we're looking at good examples of density housing. And we're also looking at bad examples. We're learning that as a class. And then we applied that to this. And we looked at these, these, uh, these things. And then recently, actually just one week ago, we, we won this housing project. An accessible and vibrant community with a wealth of amenity. It's at a density of 82 units per hectare. Um, we looked at this idea that of the diagonal movement of pedestrians across the site. It's got the courtyard, it's got the irembo, the ikipango, the ikikara. It's very important to use the words of the culture, not just to use courtyard. If you're Spanish, you use patio. 
And then we looked at how it fits on the site, learned from other principles. We looked at good examples overseas, because you people are very urbanized. And then we looked at if we go on the diagonal, you can bring these on the diagonal, you can, you can move nicely, and you can also bring the water in. And it becomes a very efficient way of designing the site. Okay? So you've got the internal courtyard. And this is low-cost housing. It's the cheapest end housing, 30 to 60 square meters for a family. And we looked at how you, you bring agriculture in. We looked at how you organize that through a system of courtyards. And what normally what happens is the developer doesn't give any public space. They cancel it out. And you end up people being like battery chickens. And then we looked at what does that courtyard entail. Now, in our practice, my partners in Rwanda are going to do the housing. I'm going to do the public building. That's how we reach a consensus of who does what, because it's, it's good. And then this is the Kigali masterclass I did with Alta University. Okay? We happened to get endowment from a foundation, an art foundation, and they have a public building program. And we took the students to Rwanda, 10 of them, for, for two weeks. We went and investigated this world that the people live in. We, we, uh, there's the master class of which I was the director. There's an overview. Then there was an environmental design input. Then there was these students, and there were other local students. So, and then this is the interaction we have while we're there in workshops. And then the community and local authority engagement and support for the current policy of the city of Kigali as the permanent relocation of urban indigent population to new villages on the periphery. They're moving its policy to move the, the, the poor people to the periphery of the city and give them good hospitals, clinics, and schools as an incentive. So we said we will work with your policy. And the choice of two Ubudugudu is village. Okay. One of them semi urban village fronting onto a wetland, and the other one located in a commanding inner state. And the process of research and living in a culture which is not your own. That's what I've been saying to my students. When you go into a culture where you don't speak the language and it's in a different environment to your own, you need to be very sharp about learning what are the important things that are different because those different things are what are going to make your, your design meaningful. And then Nelson Mandela said to us, what counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived, it is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. You as students can engage with the other 96% of the world. And as schools of architecture, you need to do it because they need you. They don't know what to do. Okay? So we went into these worlds. We did drawings. We tried to understand space. We tried to understand how people organize their daily rituals, how they organize their ritual practice, what makes a difference. And then we tackled one village. And what we did is we inherited the plan from the city, and we showed them how they could make the plan better, the students did. And what we did is we, we showed them that if they, didn't, if they didn't take the road up the steep hill and they took it this way, and then these are five student interventions, which um, are, we've given to the urban planners of the city on a formal exchange through the university. We did it as research work. And I'm just going to show you just briefly that one there and this one here. This was a sports complex, and this is a commercial complex and a training center. <coughs> I went to Finland for three weeks to work with the students, and after three months, they produced. I can give you the. I'll give you the link, and you can see the whole, the whole book if you want to. This is the traditional way. It's a very nice way of dealing with commercial, where you have rain coming down because you have a long lean-to roof. The student decided to work with that, realized that the backyards are where the interaction takes place. It's where the beer drinking and the socializing. And, and then she started a whole building school which steps down the site. Okay? Another student, there we are, you move through, she built a model. And then another student took the sports facilities and said, how can I, with a very simple architecture, um, make place? And where do the openings occur? And how can these be classrooms? And what I like about these projects is they're dealing with very simple materials and very simple place making. And you've got to make poetry out of very simple means. And this particular student did it really quite well. 
And then we went to the other site, which is, we know in five years there'll be 25,000 people here, but this is what's there today. So how do you guide it? How do you become the catalyst for change? Through using a university. So what we did is, we made that into a public pedestrian street, the existing the, the buses come to a transport node over here. We've built a market here. There's a Catholic church that goes in here. There's a beautiful project that goes here and here, which has to do with learning and disabled. And there's another marketplace here. So we started to just suggest, and we know these will be three stories, even though it's planned for that. And I'm going to show you just briefly um, one project, which is this one, which I think is a very beautiful project and a very mature work. It basically has different entrances for different needs and some of them you need to be very private because you might you might have HIV AIDS and you want to speak to the doctor and you don't want to see people coming there if it's a more communal thing you come in here and the staircase is what organizes you around three different courtyards which are on different levels I think it's a very beautiful project um, I think we missed out one of the key um, images and then um, while you're doing this, I'm doing my own work. What happened in my city uh, in 94, which is 20 years ago when we became a democracy, um, if you imagine you and Pampalona going away on holiday for six weeks, and when you come back, you find your entire town is occupied by another culture. Let's say Algeria and they occupy your university and where you go and have coffee and they occupy El Gaucho and they it, wherever you're used to going, they occupy. And, and they have different, they're from French Af Africa, they're different. And what happened is the, the European population fled here and built a piece of America, taking the stock exchange. And within three kilometers you have this place, which is the oldest township in South Africa, where there's infrastructure for 70,000, but there's over half a million. And what we're doing is we've, we've done this building, which we, we move on site in January. And uh, it's a building that tells the story of the people, and it becomes a community center. And we work with Mandela. This is the first place he stayed when he came as a young boy to, to the city, and he wrote about it. So we declared this a historical area. I worked with a measuring tape and I started measuring up the existing houses, how they've grown, how the people have adapted, where their beds are. You become their friends. You suddenly understand. In the city here last, when I was here two weeks ago, we went just down the road from El Gaucho and we, we went into the houses and we saw how people lived. It was very interesting to see how ventilation and how circulation works in these long, thin stands. Then we looked at the defensible space that people made. So when we came away from that, we started to influence our idea on density and how we design and we formed relationships with jo adjoining people. And we went into the courtyards and you can see there's no gray water, dirty water. There's a communal toilet and sewage. But it's, it's, and yet we looked at how people survive in that situation. You become their friends, you go to their funerals, you go to their weddings. And we had to negotiate the relocation of these people to a better life, so we had a site. But it has to do with public space and logia, it has to do with public space, it has to do with street edge. And it has to do with making a place that belongs to the people, empowers them. So what happens is visitors like you will come, will visit Mandela's room, then you'll come up and you'll walk through the building, then you'll come down a staircase and visit the courtyards, and the community and you'll go home or you'll have a meal here. And this becomes a center of jazz because they were good musicians. So you become an activist, you engage, and you have to decide what's an appropriate language. You design, an, you design a staircase that can extract and be pulled up, um, which we're busy doing now. But this is the context more and more architects are gonna be working in. And you have to have, you have to be simpatico and have some relationship with the people to be able to even go there. They say Johannesburg's dangerous. I go there because I'm known. It's not dangerous. If you go there dressed in leader who's from Germany, you'll get mugged. Um, and you suddenly realize that these are not steps 
it's also an amphitheater. So what you do is you design one across the road. And people use space in a different way because it's like being in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. It's a different place. And you need, these people don't pay rent, and you realize they have to be provided for because it's the informal sector and it's a huge part of the, of, of the economy. You can't just chase them away. <coughs> and at night time, we, we're going to show, we're going to show films onto a screen here. The screen turns horizontal and gives shade. This is a community meeting, interacting with people. There are shops. Um, I've just designed the details for the steel canopies that go on there. It's a job that was stopped for three years because the new government department didn't want to do what the old government department did. And th what I'm saying to you is you mustn't give up. You can affect change if you just stay with the program and you work with people and don't offend anybody. And then you run programs with people. And the spaces are beautiful. And you know, this detail here, there's another detail here which you learned from Le Corbusier. You're looking and you're learning and you're reinterpreting and you're adapting. It's what you do. And why do you do this to the stonework? It's because what the people do. It's not for the architectural magazines, it's for the people. And then, this is the leftover tiles that a poor community gets from the Europeans and they suddenly become Pit Mondrian. So what you do is you go and get all the, the granite and the marble from the rich with their vanity slabs and their bathrooms and their kitchens and you play a game with the people who, did, who worked on the heritage to become children again and to do something beautiful, which has their name on it. And then you're a tiny little firm of three to five people, and you put a bid in for the new capital of South Sudan, who want Dubai. But you can't do Dubai because they don't have the money, and it's stupid to do Dubai. So what you do is you're on the Nile, and you show them that if you do these barrios, you can start building a city. And I was in Merida in Yucatan, and I was measuring up Spanish spaces to learn about cities, because I don't know. A piazza, if, if it's more than 120 meters, you lose the space. So that's what you do. You go to the city and you measure up. I, I, when I walk with the students around Pampelona, they always see me doing this, because I'm trying to get some idea of how big is a nice car, because it's a nice color to walk in. Brought, the, brought it over. And then, um, since I left here last time, I've been unavailable because I've been here and there's no internet. Okay? This is Ngorogoro Crater. It's 90 kilometers across. This is an active volcano. There are eight volcanoes in Tanzania. And they found here footprints, 3.6 million year old footprints of our ancestors, which proves we were walking upright 3.6 million years ago. And they got very excited. And I had one day when we took UNESCO, um, we were here, we came back here, and we went down into this crater, and, and that crater there, and we were at the water, this one, so I was here last week, and we saw 32 lions, and they just had a kill, and there are the cubs. It was pretty amazing. So you suddenly, the management of these things, they wildlife, they're under threat. Um, and we know that in 2006, the volcano erupted. It gave off dust, which brought about this archaeological find 3.6 million years ago. So we showed these to the client just to remind them it can happen again. And it left footprints. Okay? Now we're working with UNESCO. How can we protect this? Because if it gets wet and it gets cold and it's covered by earth, if you, if you cover it and create a false environment, you can make it so delicious that insects and plants will destroy it. And these are the footprints. And this is erosion. Um, and we, did, we showed them where we thought some buildings should go, and they even found another find, which is more important. And we have to work with the local community. But we also have to get the opinion of the local community, because they're Christians who don't believe in evolution. These people are hunter-gatherers. They certainly don't believe, they don't know who Darwin is, and they don't believe in it. So what is their belief if we're going to have a museum? 
And these are the hunting, these are the pastoralists of the Maasai. Beautiful settlements. This is just on the way to the site. And they they have cattle. And cattle is your wealth and you exchange cattle for a wife. And she's a beautiful girl, you get a hundred cattle. And then we get to our site and we find the government has put this horrible road down which is causing the erosion for the president. Because the president came there and he said the American archaeologists have covered this up, they buried it. I want to open it for the world. And we've had to, we've had to um, uh, become part of that. And these are my drawings of the site. There's the stone covering the site. There you are on the site and you've got the stone. But the Americans have created an artificial environment which are damaging the footprints. So we now have to create an artificial environment. How do we do it? Okay, these are molds that are made. That's what it looks like now. Do we come with walls that are far apart? Um, this was a recent project we did. And then they started to do archaeology here where we were going to do the student village and the research compounds. And they found even better. So we've now pulled, except for the museum, we've pulled right out of the site. Okay? I don't know what that was. And when you go into the research compounds, we want to make a sense of village, a sense of space, so that it can be really nice. And the latest project we did, I was coloring this in the other day, is you, you enter down a, down a ramp here into a courtyard. You establish this because this is black cotton and it takes the rain and it's like a sponge. It feeds all the water underneath, which is, which is what is destroying this over here. We thought we would let light in through the roof like that and have a series of vaults. And we float the museum. So underneath this, you only have, you only have a, a point load in other words, you have 4% of the area of your museum has bearing on the site. And we did these initial drawings, which are very crude. And then these are my drawings just from this last week. We moved the research compounds right away, which is beautiful. And you've got this beautiful site, but you don't want to destroy it. So where are you going to put your buildings? And what we've done now is we were looking at the museum here. Instead of building these other facilities, we're going along the top of the hill and building them in this position at the end of the, the end of the space through the trees with a view because when you've been working in the sun here all day, you want to go and repose somewhere else. And then um, we've, dis we've just discovered uh, my partner in England has just been working with this at a pr in, in, on a project in London. And we said, why don't we use this way of vaulting? because we can, have a, we can have a system of light. So we're investigating. You just have point loads at these points. OK? So this happened, this, this happened last night. And I had to go to, to town to work with Guillaume and, and colleagues to help me put the lecture together. And here is a, a project we've been trying to get built in the first women's museum. Women in South Africa, traditionally, when they buried, they buried in this position in a pot, because pots are very significant. And so when you're designing a building like this, uh, which tells the story of struggle of women and the voices of women, we look at the egg and we look at the pot. What other metaphor do you, do you look for? And how you can come inside and ramp down and go through, uh, go through an ambulatory where you look at the archive of 3,000 embroideries. Now, this idea is coming into the Lytoli scheme. It's interesting how one, one scheme borrows another. And, um, and I think this will get built. We're we having to just raise the funds at the moment. And then I get back to this business of Kigali and materials. Okay. And when you went to Kigali in 2007, you had beautiful tiled roofs. You know those Spanish tiles that you make on your thigh, like the Romans? They're fat and thin. And you thought you were in ancient China. Someone came from the EU and told them they've got to stop this because they're using fuels that are not renewable for their ovens. Now they have corrugated iron, and it obviously has no positive effect. And we've just told the government that if they use the waste product from the rice, you can fire the kilns. So I'm trying to say to students, um, when you graduate, you can change whole societies if you go and do it. 
and you have this incredible training as architects. You have this holistic Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Humanities, Bachelor of Technology. You have this unbelievable world to go. We didn't get this church built. Um, we're getting this built. We're getting that built. We'll build this somewhere else. And we're getting that one built. And we couldn't get that one built until we went and had dinner at 10 Downing Street with, with, uh, with uh, Prime Minister Cameron, and we got all the funding in one night. You've got to play those games. If you're doing bottom-up work, you have to go from the top every now and then to make things happen because it needs the president to, to kick somebody for it to happen. And you don't say you can't get there. You can get there. Okay? So that's my, that's my message to you. And then I just want to close. Uh, I, I discussed this with the class. Ray Cappy um, has designed one of the truly iconic houses of the world in Los Angeles. He's about 88 now. He started the school at Sioc. They had a dean in California who was terrible, and he and some friends walked out one day, and they went and bought a building and started a school of architecture. Forget about that. But he wrote a book, and I just thought these are so beautiful. Just make your own list and see what comes out. He was asked to think of the 10 most important principles that helped make me a successful architect planner. The first one, think positively, not negatively. It helps. Okay? Don't give up. Accept structure, but know what that it is to be questioned and broken where necessary. I'm dealing with students on the monasteries. You know, there's, there's, there's the, the wonderful Chilean student. He has this monastery that floats. And today I came and he had walls where they were rectilinear with rounded corners. And I said, no, before you had something. He said, well, I want the, the entrance walls to be different to the monastery. I said, yes, but... Go back to your first joins and make them different. Break the order. Don't look at like, you, you need to have the courage to do that. He's got such a beautiful scheme, but he's starting to get scared. Um, uh, always be willing to explore, experiment, and invent. Do not accept the status quo. That's what our little office in Africa is doing. We've got three guys and we're changing our whole government because we're crazy. You've got to be loco a little bit. Know yourself and keep your work consistent with who you are and how you think. Don't be influenced by the magazines. Be who you are. A lot of the great architects, older people like myself, are the ones who didn't move sideways because of postmodernism. They just stayed with what they believed. People like the Sotter in that. You do beautiful work. You don't have to be part of fashion. In fact, it's boring to be part of fashion. Maintain good um, morals and social values have core principles. Be humble, honest, compassionate, and egalitarian. Have conviction about your work. Believe in yourself. Believe in your intuition. Believe in who you are. Be open and say yes to most ideas and requests. The good ones will, will be valuable, and the bad ones will cease to exist. But fortunately in life, we remember the good times, not the bad times. Allow employees and fellow workers freedom and the ability to work to their strengths and avoid hierarchy. It's most important. And money should be the residual of the work, not the goal, but do not compromise your work. What's most important here is as soon as you compromise yourself here, you will be disrespected by the, the client and it will end up not with a good outcome. So you have to establish sufficient faith in you to be able to do the work and you have to have an agreement and if you build if you're working with friends like I am you have to have an agreement because fights are always about money so don't be stupid just because someone's your amigo doesn't mean you don't have a contract you must have a contract and you must you must realize that the work the quest you on is the most important I don't know any architects who who don't lead a good life you know so these are 10 points which I leave with you to think about you can make your own 10 points I found it quite difficult because these are so encompassing. <coughs> we have this fantastic profession, and you have all the power you need at your hands and a privileged education. So I want you to go back to wherever you belong. If it's Pampelona, it's fine. If it's in Latin America, it's fine. And transform your society and become active in the realities of a changing world. Thank you.